Our dreams are coming true, and from a small beginning, a great campus will develop here. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much. Maude Frazier, anyone recognize who actually did the voiceover? Any guesses? Carolyn Sparks, actually former regent. But we owe a great uh, debt of, uh, 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 of gratitude to Maude Frazier. I'll, I'll speak a bit more about her in a few moments. Uh, many consider the founder of the university and also to Carolyn Sparks. But thank, thanks to both of them and thanks to you all. We're going to do something I think a little fun today. We're going to go a little, little UNLV past, UNLV present, UNLV future. And we'll start off with a little bit of a, of a historical journey, uh, as it were. Population of Clark County, about the time we began, 1957, 100,000 people. Today, the booming metropolis that we all know of 2.2 million plus and a very vibrant, bustling city that's back on a very steep growth curve. It, it's an exciting time. Take a look at our student body, uh, 1957. So we actually began before 1957 with occasional kind of a class here and a class there with small cohorts of students and then began proper in 1957 with a cohort estimated to be around 500 students. Here, uh, the historians tell us that these students are actually registering, filling out forms manually. I think one student's looking over on another student's work there. Uh, <laughs> but now, uh, from, you know, then from 500 students, uh, now we've just passed the 30,000 student mark. We had our uh, first time ever, we had our largest freshman class at 4,150 or so, and this is UNLV Creates, which has become an entire uh, production in and of itself. Now this one, we put the names in there because I knew everyone would be trying to guess which, what these buildings are. Uh, two of them are still standing and we're still using them. Uh, Maude Fraser Hall is no longer there. The Barrack Museum, that actually was, it had a long name, but it was the gym. The nickname was the old gym. It's, it still has the old wooden parquet floor uh, from the gym days, but the Barrack Museum that's, uh, occupies that building now, and of course we still use that. And then Grant Hall, which is right on Maryland Parkway. Parking, not as much a problem uh, back then. <laughs> and, uh, and Maryland Parkway, traffic was a breeze. In the uh, lower left-hand corner, we believe that was the first Starbucks, I think, down there. <laughs> and now uh, the campus, if you kind of consider all of the land that we occupy or that are about to occupy, it's about 350 acres proper on the main campus. Uh, and with all the adjoining lots that we've been purchasing around the campus, plus the 42 acres, plus 122 acres in the research park, plus 2,000 acres, we're about to take on in North Las Vegas and another larger research park. It's about 2,500 acres plus. The campus has clearly uh, grown, expanded its footprint uh, in the last 60 years. Well, see if you can recognize who these folks are. Uh, then... Uh, we've got uh, Artemis Ham Jr. with his foot on the shovel, and that's Judy Bailey uh, looking at him. And then the couple next to them over on the right side are the Fongs, a, a philanthropic couple that helped us quite a bit. Fundraising with that group began with, a, there was an initial goal, I guess you could call it a campaign. There was an initial goal of $35,000. They raised $50,000. That was the beginning uh, for the university philanthropically. Then, of course, we've just finished this last year with a record-breaking fundraising year in gifts and new pledges and gifts in kind. All together, all new, $93 million. With a $25 million gift for the School of Medicine, I'm sure you've read about, best year ever for athletics, uh, and that was led by a, a $10 million gift from the Fatita family. We actually had 13 gifts above a million dollars last year, and that's amazing in and of itself. And what I find interesting about the gifts that came in at that level, we, were, we got gifts from people that have no connection to UNLV. They're not necessarily alum and don't necessarily even live in the Las Vegas Valley. For example, the gift from John Huntsman Sr. from Utah for the endowed chair in Senator Harry Reid's name. 243 million raised in the last three years, a long way from the, the initial $50,000 for the university and its first uh, would-be campaign. Back then, the first graduating class took a while. Um, there wasn't 15 to finish, so by 1964, 
we had a group that graduated. 29 students was our first graduating class. Again, we're back to, the, to what is now the Barrick Museum, and the, and the historians tell me that that's uh, on the gym. There's a little carpet laid out on the, on the playing surface, and that was where the first uh, graduation was held, truly a multi-purpose facility. And uh, today, our graduations t uh, are with 5,000-plus students, if you consider the two big ceremonies in the Thomas and Mac, and now all the smaller, separate graduations that we do throughout the, that weekend, 5,000-plus uh, graduating. Uh, first graduate degree was, was, came a few years later, so that's 50 years ago we started doing graduate degrees. The first doctorate was actually an EDD, uh, and that was 40 years ago. And then under President Maxim, Maxim in the 80s, we began doing more aggressively into doctorates, spreading into PhD programs, and then of course in the 90s then really ramped up in doctoral education. As a doctoral granting research university, we're really not that old. Uh, our alumni, we had two. Uh, that's, the, that's them, not really. But we had no alumni, not till the graduating class of 1964. We had 29 alum, and then the next year, another 30 or so, and then we kept building. Uh, so that was then, and of course now, we have over 115,000 alum that we track. And like I said, with graduates of 5,000 plus every year, that's 5,000 new graduates adding to that number, multiplying rapidly. Now, I know you'll enjoy this next one. That's the central administration. That was the heart <laughs> of the first <laughs> leadership team for the university. The president, the registrar, all of the staff, that, they're all there. And th that's in what we think was the supply cl uh, closet at the old Las Vegas high school. Uh, our president at that point is a, uh, an uncanny resemblance to Walt Disney. If you look closely, <laughs> I think, in fact, it might be him. What's the funniest thing about that photo is that was the old high school, seriously, and when they would have a play at the high school, the, the administration was kicked out of that room because they had to use that room uh, to queue up for the play and to change clothes and those kinds of things. That was then, uh, and now, of course, uh, the campus is quite expansive. In fact, multiple campuses, right? I mean, we've got the main campus, the old Paradise School. I mentioned the, the research parks the new medical district building where the dental school is now, and so we're a lot of people, uh, now close to uh, 42, 4,300 people spread across a lot of places. All right, let's see if you can guess who these folks are. We did not have a performing arts center. Uh, that's, the, that's the old gym, that's the Barrick Museum. <laughs> Any guesses on who that is performing live on campus? Mary. Peter, Paul, and Mary are performing. That was then, and of course now, we're in the Judy Bailey Theater celebrating its 45th anniversary, and then across the way, Artemis Ham Hall, which is also 40 plus years old. So performing arts has come a long way in the 60 years. We started out with just a handful of veterans. Of course, people were taking advantage of the GI Bill at the time, but nowhere near what we do now, you're going to fast forward 60 years, and our military and veteran service center is considered to be among the best in the country. We have around 1,800 students with active military and military veterans going through that program uh, and their families. Uh, the advisor, Ross Bryant, uh, just with this last year received the Advisor of the Year Award nationally uh, for military and veterans programs on campuses. And of course, we serve all branches. The Coast Guard's tucked down in there, you can see on the bottom. But we're quite proud of what we do and what, our, what we do with our, our military uh, and veteran students and, and what they do and what they accomplish as well. All right, let's see. This next one should be easy. I think you recognize Elvis. Who's he dancing with? And Margaret, of course. This is filmed on campus. This is actually from Viva Las Vegas, which is, of course, part one of our, practically our theme song. Uh, at sporting events. The band does a really good rendition of it. That was then. Now we've got a, a, a bevy of uh, illustrious alum. Uh, this, of course, is celebrity chef Guy Fieri. And I'm looking for Stowe. And Guy's son is a sophomore now, I think, just starting into his junior, in his junior year in the hospitality college. And of course, here he's talking with Chef Lindsay and Chef Sandoval, I, I believe. And I think Guy has a Raiders cap on, if you look closely, I, I think. <laughs> We 
we've, as students in Atugawa, we've demonstrated resiliency and spirit then and now, these students in a team building experience. Throughout our existence, we've had community and faculty and staff all coming together to work on important and interesting problems then and now, all aimed at service, all aimed at helping and, and pulling in the community as a partner to do so. And we're proud of, of all of that, that rich history of community and service. That's what we're about. Thanks to all of them, and thanks to everybody in, engaged in UNLV then and now. Let's take a moment of silence as we do each year, and we'll thank all those who passed on this past year, and just in memory, and think about all of the service and support that they gave this great university. Thank you. I think it's fitting that we do that. On the, yes. <laughs> on the shoulders of giants. Now, I mentioned Maude Frazier at the start. We've got to take a moment to talk about Maude. Just a, just a quick moment here. School superintendent, an assemblywoman, lieutenant governor, the first woman in the lieutenant governor spot in the state, a visionary, a leader, and a woman, I think many would say, with a lot of grit. And she saw the need for a full-time dedicated university in Las Vegas and, and fought for it. Many thought her to be the founder if you had to pick somebody of this university. We have statues of her. Uh, this one, for example, Maud Fraser Way as we come in on the east side of campus. We owe a lot to Maud. Let's take a look at some of the others uh, that helped along the way with her to get this university started. This started out as a public-private partnership. It was a P3 before anybody knew what that was. The, uh, the beginning was the state agreeing to put $200,000 in for the first building on campus. And then the match was that the community had to step up and take care of the land. And that's when I mentioned that they needed about 35,000 raised to purchase the land. And they ran a little mini campaign. Maud was right there leading everyone. And they raised $50,000. That was the initial campaign. That was the, the match or the partnership. Uh, with the state to do that. The group that did that was the Campus Fund Committee. And Scott, and I'm looking for Scott Roberts, that's, that's the precursor to the foundation. I mean, that's now, uh, now we have our modern foundation, but that was the first group to do that. They ran a, a fun campaign called the Porchlight Campaign. This was in 1955, and the fundraisers were high school seniors. Uh, they, they borrowed students, folks from the community, and they literally went door to door, knocking on doors for donations, and then, and then if you were going to participate, then you turned on your porch light to show support. This is actually a picture of the household's house. Uh, that's in its original location. Uh, part of the, that, was a, that was a great knock on that door because they actually gave us the house. And the house, <laughs> that, literally the house was moved to campus, and it's now on the south end of the campus. It holds the Center for Social Justice, and I hear the house is haunted uh, for what it's worth. Uh, 
the Housel's family, uh, huge supporters of the fine arts, uh, big supporters of this campus and a lot of other things in the community. You might have seen in, in the In Memoriam slides, we lost J.K. Housel's uh, Jr. this past year. Many of us, I'm seeing Don there, we're at his uh, memorial. Uh, but uh, great debt of gratitude to them. That's, that's the house and the Porchlight campaign. But a true uh, community effort. Uh, in the, the media also got behind it, the newspaper, the television station, all helping to draw in money to get the campus started. It was really quite a community effort with the media right there behind us. This is one of the, one of the print ads that went out. Let's take a look at some of the individuals uh, here in a little short video that have contributed to our success and see what they say about the evolution that I'm talking about. You know, his growth in the last 40 years has been uh, dramatic. Uh, when I came in the early 1970s, it was just a, a, a small college with maybe 3,000 students and a few hundred faculty. And it's grown to a research university, a large one, and over a thousand faculty. This kind of wonderful oasis of, of learning pops up in the middle of this town, in the middle of the Mojave Desert. And it is this kind of wonderful place where people come together to share interesting ideas and to educate young people and to seek new knowledge. How awesome is that? my accounting professor that it, it was a, a very unusual and special experience where I mean his his way of teaching was it was more than teaching um, it, it was it was more than leading it was, it was mentoring as well and he wanted us to strive to be much better than we had imagined and set for and goals set for ourselves and that was a whole different way of thinking so he took me once again in, in, in the areas and opportunities that I never dreamt of. That's what changed my life. Yeah, it's great. Of course, Scott, Randy Garcia there at the end, uh, one of our trustees. All right, that's part one, the past. Now let's shift and talk about the present. We began about two years ago, uh, two and a half years ago, on a strategic planning process around our vision to be a top tier university. We're about a year and a half into that plan. It's a 10-year plan. And essentially, we aim to be a top tier, a top-ranked university at research, at our teaching and student experience, and at community impact. All of it aimed at just being better in our community, impacting people positively in our community. That's the goal, very simply put. And we've got five pathway goals that we monitor uh, in order to check and see how we're doing on that. And so we'll, just, we'll run through them quickly and just think about some of the things that have happened over the past year in each of those five pathway goals for our top tier plan. So first, research, scholarship, and creative activity. So among the many stats that we track are how we're doing with our research funding. Research expenditures grew this last year by 7.5% to about $53 million. And research awards grew over 27% to $70 million, unprecedented heights for the university. We're clearly growing the research enterprise. We'll give you some examples of some things that happened along the way to do that. UNLV is leading an NSF-funded, a National Science Foundation-funded alliance. It's a $4.6 million grant that spans across southern Nevada and northern Arizona. And it's all research and some mentorship programs all focus on underrepresented students in STEM fields and mentoring them in through into the science, technology, engineering, and math and related fields. There are about 500 students this fall that are enrolled in that NSF-funded program. Uh, it's a faculty member that we're proud of, astrophysicist Zhao Jun Zhu, uh, is our first Sloan Research Fellow. That's a very rare, very difficult to achieve fellowship uh, from the Sloan Foundation. And it's our first time to ever have one. We're very proud of, of, of having a Sloan Scholar on campus. That's the, the Sloan Foundation chooses a, a group of faculty around the country that they consider to be the next generation of scientific leaders uh, globally. I enjoy this picture for so many reasons. Uh, and I, <laughs> I won't go into all of them. But the College of Engineering uh, has had a, developed a great relationship, Rama, with NASA, and specifically here with the Orion program. This represents the signing of a $5 million partnership with Lockheed Martin. And the quote uh, from S Scott Jones at Lockheed Martin is, the road to Mars goes through Las Vegas and through UNLV. Uh, that's what Rama tells us. Fantastic. <clears throat> Mm. 
And Zach, I think, is looking and saying, I've never actually seen $5 million. And, <laughs> and Ram is saying, you're not going to touch any of this. Uh, <laughs> Our Black Mountain Institute, of course, we're very proud of. Uh, Josh Shank and the team, and with the help of Beverly Rogers and Carol Harder, we think it's the best, best in class, the best program in the country, certainly among the best. Among their accomplishments this past year, there were many, but they purchased Believer Magazine. That's not a fan magazine for the Imagine Dragons. That's actually a leading journal of arts and culture, and we bought it, and that now is run here out of our Black Mountain Institute by Josh and his team. They also uh, hosted the American Dream International Festival this last spring. So they are making a national and international footprint now as one of the finest literary programs in the country. And based off the NASA work, NASA liked what we were doing so much in the engineering program, in particular with Teledyne Brown, Teledyne Brown Engineering, that they gave us a, a national award for that relationship with Teledyne they're, they call it the Mentor-Protégé Agreement of the Year. They picked that one nationally the, of the relationship that they thought was working the best. That's a program where engineering students create instructional materials and inst instructional programs for astronauts at the International Space Station. Really fun project, I know, for the folks in engineering. Great award from NASA. The Boyd School of Law jumped a, a huge 16 spots in the U.S. News rankings to 62nd. Uh, I know having been at a business school and chasing U.S. news rankings for, at a college level, how hard that is. Dan, just really proud of your team and all the hard work, and that was a great accomplishment among many for last year. Well done. Our library, uh, the, the set of libraries, with this initial main hub for it, of course, is a beautiful facility, but what's even more beautiful about the libraries is what goes on inside of it. An independent group last year ranked library faculty on their research. Library faculty do what they write and they present on libraries and library services. The independent group ranked all the library faculty across the, the country based on their research, quality and, and productivity, and found that our library faculty were 15th in the country on their, on their productivity, which is amazing. It's amazing. There's so many other things we could talk about on the, on the research dimension, we just wanted to give you some highlights. Pathway goal number two, student achievement, student success, student outcomes. Let's just uh, talk through a couple of examples. Our college matching program had a, had a great year. That's where we, we sit down with students and figure out exactly what it is that drives them. What's the passion point? And then spend a lot of time thinking very carefully about what to match them to in terms of what they major in or minor in, where their areas of study are. That helps students save time uh, as they're going through school and not have to try something out and change their mind and switch again. That program had a great year and, uh, and we're proud of the work that they're doing. One of our students specifically, an engineering entertainment grad, Kevin Brecky, that's not Kevin right there, uh, but <laughs> He entered into the American Ninja Warrior National Obstacle Design Contest. He wasn't actually in the American Ninja Contest, but it was a design contest to, to put together uh, the different obstacles that the athletes have to go through. And he designed uh, an event uh, called Crank It Up, and he won the National Design Contest for that. And that's an example of it there. Uh, it's not Kevin nor me. Uh, I don't know that I could, I don't think I could do that. Another one of our students uh, in the School of Architecture, Brandon Siebrecht, designed, I mean, talk about sort of taking advantage of what's going on around him. We've got the Hyperloop development going on here in North Las Vegas. And so he designed the Hyperloop Hotel based off of, you know, what would you do with the Hyperloop once it was built? And he designed a, ho a hotel concept around the Hyperloop. And he entered into the 2017 uh, Radical Innovation uh, uh, Contest a worldwide competition, and he won. And he now is enrolled into our Masters of Architecture program, and we're very happy to have him continuing as a student with us. <laughs> so proud of our athletes. In this segment, I just wanted to highlight their academic performance. We had 119 student athletes that were this last year that were part of the 2017 uh, 
uh, Mountain West all academic team for their, the grades that, and the work that they're putting in in the classroom. We're very proud of them for that. Very proud of our scholar athletes. On the south side of campus, you might have seen this house being built uh, on the old Paradise, on the, kind of on the back of the old Paradise School grounds right there off Tropicana. That's this year's team, one of 13 in the country, building that house to go compete in the Solar Decathlon in a few weeks uh, in Denver, Colorado. It's a self-sustaining house, and their theme was they're also building it so that whoever lives in it can age in place, so that you could stay in the home late in your life based on the way that it's designed, based on the, the health-related technology that's in the building. If you want to see it, let Rama know, but you've got to go quickly because they're going to be moving it on a flatbed to Denver, and then Rama and Christy and I and others will be up in Denver at the competition watching them. Three years ago, three, four years ago, they... They competed, and they, they were the top in the United States, and then they came in second in the global competition, and the team is aggressively aiming to win the competition this year. So best of luck, Rama. <laughs> Our Honors College continues to grow and grow. We had 316 new students in the Honors College in the cohort coming in. Let me just give you a sense of what that cohort of students looks like. 63 high school valedictorians in that cohort. The average GPA for the incoming cohort for the Honors College, 3.89, essentially a 3.9. They had five new national merit scholars just in this cohort. Total size of the Honors College now, 1,000 students. They're now picking off the best students, not only around the city, the city but around the state uh, and well beyond. Uh, we just put them in new facilities, uh, and they're already growing out of it. We've, now we've got to figure out what to do there. But really proud of the Honors College and the growth there. Way to go. <laughs> this is, I think you've heard about uh, students take a class in the, uh, the Gaming Innovation Center, and they design game, games, either traditional games for casinos, and, and in many cases, online games, virtual games, uh, e-games on, uh, on your phone and those kinds of things. We, and, and students actually do really well, and those games are purchased uh, by gaming companies, and students often make money. This last year, I had a student, Matthew Stream, that developed a, a table game, a kind of a classic casino-based table game called Easy Jack, and that got a field trial this past year at Harrah's, and then I know Zach and others are working to then see if there's a, a commercialization opportunity for that student, but we're, we're proud of Matthew for that. We had another team. Yeah, it's great, Matt. Good job. This is a team called Winging It. Winging It. This is two students in engineering plus some other graduate students, and they won the grand prize in the Consumer Electronics Show Smart Cities Hackathon. So it was essentially when CES was here in town, they, they had a hackathon competition. There were about 30 teams in the final competition, and they, they won it, a team uh, right here from UNLV. That's pretty good. I think I might have skipped over. Let me just come back. Yes, I did. Sorry, Amber, I apologize. Amber Turner is a geology major and a first-generation college student, just like me. She's an ROTC student, hired by NASA already, thanks to that NASA, NASA relationship. She had a great summer. She spent interning at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. What a way to spend the summer. And I'm proud of where she's headed. Uh, as a, I tr trust me, as a first-generation college student, I'm just amazed at, at what these students are, are achieving here. There's Dave. Of course, you recognize Dave Loeb there in the Jazz Fest uh, Ensemble. So they, they tied for first place in the Monterey Next Generation Jazz Competition and then that allows them to then perform at the actual Monterey Jazz Competition coming up this weekend, I believe. That, uh, Dave tells us that's, that, that winning that, coming in for, uh, tied for first for that, is the equivalent of in basketball, the NCAA Final Four, winning the Final Four, or at least being within the two championship teams at the end of, a, of an NCAA Division I basketball season. So they're quite happy with, with how uh, these uh, students are performing, and, and I am too. And then I was skipping ahead. This is a group of accounting students, and they won the Institute for Management Accounting's case competition. It's the first time ever for us to be in that competition, so we took a chance, and the Lee Business School sent them down, and they won the competition. So uh, good job, Brent, and your team. <laughs> I 
And then finally, just one more example. Albert Antero is a student not in this picture, uh, but he placed second in the annual tri-state business plan competition that, that we put on, that we participate in every year. And he put together a company and a technology called Game Trainer, and it's an esports online play. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, but he's, he's in the esports space and put together a way for, for people to train for esports competitions and has done quite, quite well with it. And it'd be fun, Zach, to see where they go with that startup as well. So a lot we could have talked about in that student achievement section, but we're really happy with uh, this, how the students have done. Thank you, everybody, for their support. <laughs> the third pathway goes around the Academic Health Center, and that involves all the assets that we have here at UNLV around human health. So let's look at a couple of the highlights from this last year. This is a, a great picture of the signing of, of the handing over, if you will, of the little bit more than nine acres from the county down in the medical district, so right to the north of the dental, dental school and just to the east of University Medical Center. And that will be the home of the medical education building. This is a great partnership. Of course, the land came from the county, and so you can see county commissioner uh, Steve Sislak there and Lawrence Weekly and John O'Reilly and others that are associated with the county and with UMC. It's a great partnership with the county and with the city and, and Mayor Goodman and also a big player in that has been Lois Tarkanian as well. Great partnership, city, county, university, regents, and that was the initial kind of handing over. And then just within a month or two, we actually physically took possession of the land. If you go down there now, it's been, everything's been raised and it's ready to go to be built on. And then just a month or two ago for the medical school, we accepted in our inaugural class of 60 students, July 17th uh, to be precise, 60 new students on 60 full ride scholarships, four year full ride scholarships. They began a very innovative, very, very innovative, very applied curriculum by becoming EMTs. They essentially did EMT training and then certified, actually took the exam. And there are many experiences like that throughout the curriculum. It's designed to be very hands-on, have experience with patients, and to get them out in the community. So it's kind of community-based medicine, if you want to think of it that way. So it was a great start, really fun to get the medical school going. We also kicked off this last year the uh, Ackerman Autism Center. Great partnership with the Ackerman family and with the Grant to Gift Association. There were literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of families with autistic children, or with children they didn't even know, they didn't even have a diagnosis, that, that had nowhere to go. And they were queued up in this community with really nowhere to go and no help to get from anyone until we started the Ackerman Autism Center. And now we've processed all those families through, now their clients, full service clinic, not only for the, the students, the, the, the children, but for their families as well with, with uh, counseling services and a number of other things. What a great start clinically for the School of Medicine. We had an interdisciplinary group from all around campus participate in, the, in this global health initiative. The Global Health Forum in particular was an effort where scholars came in from all around the world, uh, India, Guatemala, Nigeria, uh, everywhere, and they all descended on UNLV this past spring with our faculty and graduate students all focused on maternal and child health issues worldwide. So it was, just a, it was a great moment again for our, our entire academic health sciences system to participate in such an important global effort. We had our, last year, we celebrated our fifth year in the Mountain West Clinical Translational Research Infrastructure Network. What does that mean? That's, an, again, another big National Institutes of Health grant. That involves 13 universities all throughout the Mountain West, all focused on various human health issues, and UNLV leads that 13 university effort, all funded by the NIH. Uh, our lead person on that now is Parvesh Kumar, is our cancer, cancer specialist in the School of Medicine. But credit to him uh, for managing it uh, as soon as he came in the door. But Carl Ryber and others I know were responsible for, for bringing that grant to the university and put us, putting us in a leadership position to get it. But they had a great year last year. It's a, a, a facial recognized. Professor Carolee Dodge Francis, and this is public health alum, Crystal Lee, presented uh, the topic, diverse tribal perspectives in healthcare for Native Americans. Important topic, but what was really neat about it, they presented live at the United Nations, the UN. Uh, the two of them were presenting on this important topic. Really proud of them.
And then final one, we're just picking examples. School of Dental Medicine last year launched a new two-year DDS degree. It's aimed for people who are dentists in other countries and might have gone through a dental, dental school that doesn't have US accreditation. So an example would be a dentist in Cuba uh, decides that he or she wants to come to the United States but doesn't have a, a degree that's certified with the, U, with the US standards. And so the, the dental school created this special two-year certification program, program exactly for dentists just like that so they can quickly become certified and practice here. It was a great year for our allied health sciences, and I can't wait to see what's coming up this year. It's going to be a fun year. And then the fourth uh, uh, pathway goal on the top tier strategic plan is community partnerships. And just to refresh people's memory, we, we added this as we were doing the strategic planning process because we went, and, we went and benchmarked other universities, right? We said, let's go look at other doctoral granting research universities in urban areas that have already jumped up to the top Kearney category in the last 10 to 15 years. Let's go see how they did it. So we went and visited ASU in Tempe and University of Central Florida, Orlando, and University of Houston. And the thing that we discovered, in addition to our provost, Diane Chase, who was at UCF as a vice provost, was that they were incredible partners in their communities. And, and Don's always fond of saying, you kind of can't have one without the other. You, you can't have a, have a great university without the help of a community. And you can't have a great community without a great research university helping to lift that community. And we saw that in each of those three universities. And we came back and created a new pathway goal around community partnerships. And now we have a whole team tracking that and sub goals and metrics. And let's see how the year went there. This is a, a handshake deal and an MOU signing with Tesla. Uh, again, our, our, our engineering faculty and, and graduate students have been working by contract uh, water-based water conservation research around the manufacture of the batteries from Panasonic uh, for the cars uh, for Tesla up north. And this is how that began. That, in the last year or two, so I'm going to stretch back kind of a year or two, our count is about 40 research-based partnerships like that one with Tesla. And then if you consider all of the community-based, so with the Clark, Car Clark, County, uh, Clark County School District, all the community-based partnerships that we do, including the research-based partnerships, the total over the last couple of years was 380 community partnerships the last two years. We take, we take the community partnership goal seriously and making great strides there. We launched our Office of Community Engagement. Sue DeBella now running that and has a team of people minding the store, if you will, on all these 380 partnerships and helping them to get started, helping to steward the relationships. Uh, they opened just this last year. We learned that we needed one of those when we, when we visited the other universities. Uh, and they've done a great job kind of getting us off on the right foot as you know, the goal is to become the partnership university nationally and to become the go-to partner here in the community uh, for everyone in the community. The collaborative had a great year as well. This is an institution-wide initiative to help students kind of from K through uh, post-grad work. Uh, the, the, the goal is to transform urban multicultural education one specific program that had a great year last year is Abriendos Caminos, literally pathways for students of color and students from other underrepresented groups to, to be helped into careers to become teachers, particularly in STEM fields. And they had a, a great year, and we're really proud of the success of the collaborative. Of course, our Center for Academic Enrichment and Outreach continues to just be a juggernaut here in this community and for attracting grant funding. Just last year, $7.7 .7 million Department of Education grant, and their work is aimed at, at kind of low-income, first-generation students and adults throughout the community, kind of helping them through the K-12 pipeline to get into college, whether it's here at UNLV or CSN or Nevada State or UNR or anywhere. Uh, Dr. William Sullivan and also Dr. Keith Rogers lead the team there, and the work is phenomenal. They're one of the, in addition to engineering, one of the most successful grant-getting groups on this campus. They had a great year. Thank you. <clears throat> 
two faces will recognize this is the, the MGM Public Policy Institute. You recall that was also launched, great partnership, great community engagement effort this past year. They're the co-chair, Speaker Boehner and Senator Reid. Uh, we've met with them several times, now starting to shape what the Policy Institute will look like. Uh, managed by, with Rob and his team and Urban Affairs, but with participation from Dan and the team and Boyd Law and others on campus. And then we've got multiple events now planned coming for this year. More to come on that later, but that was launched this year. We're, we're happy to do it. Again, I want to touch just quickly on the UNLV student-athletes. I mentioned the grades before. Now I want to talk about the student-athletes in terms of community service. Collectively, each year, each of the Mountain West schools, the, the athletes all compete with each other on how, how many service hours they put in going out in the community and helping, helping students to read, for example. Our student-athletes last year put in over 13,000 hours collectively, and they won the Mountain West Community Service Award. Which is fantastic. <clears throat> 13,000 hours. Next closest Mountain West school was, was 5,000 hours less. So if, it, if, it, if this was, a, if this was a, a race out on the track, they would have probably called the race off. I mean, it was that, it was that far ahead. And then in addition, I just want to quickly say, just so proud of both the work that Tina has done and that now Desiree is doing. In the last year and a half or so, uh, our student athletes won 10 or 11 Mountain West championships. So great performance on the field as well. And now to, uh, not to be undone, uh, for Kim, our College of Education undergraduate students also set a goal to do community service each year. This is a bigger group, but the undergraduate students in the College of Education collectively out in the community for 125,000 hours of service in classrooms and in counseling. And that's what it's all about. And then finally, one other, game, uh, one other example from eSports, our International Gaming Institute launched a, a, a heavy, aggressive, very entrepreneurial effort into eSports. Uh, the, the work that they're doing, the faculty and the students involved, is on all aspects of e-gaming, e not only legal and regulatory, but on coming up with new games, how to structure competitions, how to, how to, uh, how e-sports instantiates itself into the casinos. It's just a marvelously entrepreneurial and aggressive effort last uh, year to, to launch it. The Mountain West presidents, I won't mention who, but one of the presidents at one of the schools that does a pretty good job with athletics, kind of went out on the email distribution list pretty proud of what they were doing in, in eSports and just wanted to get a sense of what the other schools were doing and then I, we just blew, we blew away the field with what our International Gaming Institute is doing in eSports, so it's pretty, pretty neat. And then finally, in infrastructure and shared governance. Uh, we're running out of room, quite frankly, uh, and we need, to, we need to build more uh, capacity into what we're doing. We'll hit a couple of the highlights this past year. You might have read about the Cox communication deal. I could have put that back in the partnership section, but I pulled it ahead into infrastructure because over the next three years, starting just a bit ago, Cox communication in a seven-year multi-million dollar agreement is basically lighting up this entire campus with Wi-Fi. Uh, that'll have tremendous impact on everybody's uh, productivity and, and happiness, I'm sure, uh, and being able to connect better. And then this one we just threw in for fun because these signs drove me nuts <laughs> with the three-letter acronyms. Uh, like many of the new students and their, and their parents that kind of week before classes and the first week of classes would walk around campus kind of like I did when I first got here and I'd look at that sign. I thought it was an eye test. I was uh, trying to read the letters. We are getting rid of those and we're adding actual signs. <laughs> so, gee. So there you go, Gene. That's going to get on that. I think that, that's actually gone. So that sign is still there, but not the acronyms. I think it's already off that one. And we're adding better signs. And they're actually displaying the full names of buildings because the names mean something uh, in addition. <laughs> and then here's a snap, just a, just a relatively recent snap of Hospitality Hall. Uh, this will be done by the end of the fall. 
We're planning on the, the actual uh, kind of dedication in January. The, we'll be able to begin in it in January, I believe, for, for act, formal activities. But that building is shaping up so nicely. That's a $57 million project, public-private partnership. The state put up half. We raised between 25 and 26 million. We've got another two, three million to go to finish it off. Stowe and his team have a very active pipe, pipeline of donors and cultivation. They're still kind of primarily working at the larger gifts, They're kind of now just beginning to work on the smaller stuff. You can get your name on a tile, I understand, if people would like to. But we're just so happy with that project, and I know the community is as well. Uh, and that's a, it's a world-class building now to match a world-class academic program. You guys deserve the building. Thank you. <laughs> Our engineering program is one of the fastest growing on campus. And in the last 10 to 15 years, they've doubled their enrollments. They've got about 2,500 now or so students majoring. Uh, they're basically in one Thomas Beam. I almost said TBE. There you go. They're in Thomas Beam Engineering at Hall. Uh, it's their one main dedicated building. They do have some people in the science and engineering building, SEB, uh, <laughs> but they need more space. So we got in the last legislative session with a lot of help from our regents, uh, got the planning money for that building, and then we'll be back in the, the next legislative session to go after the construction funding. And I know Rama and his crew can't wait. <laughs> yeah, way to go. <clears throat> The football uh, practice facility had a, got a big boost from the regents last week, thank you, and voted to approve to let us move forward in building that project. We got about 20 million raised for it. We need about another 2 million or so for the, for the, before the groundbreaking to get the project started. We were approved to essentially do some financing to get it started like we did with Hospitality Hall. But that will be transformational uh, for the football program and for athletics, especially financially. So we can't wait to get that program started. In another sport, just picked one of the uh, facilities improvements that's going on. We are committed to resurfacing the track, finally. Uh, got, got, I know a lot of people use it, uh, and I know that means something to you, but it's got a couple of bald spots. We've committed to resurfacing. We're also looking into the feasibility of going beyond it. We just don't know how much it'll cost yet, but it would be nice to have lights and to have some more grandstands and a few other amenities so you could really use that thing all year round and at night. Uh, but for now, we're, we're going to start on the resurfacing and then see how far we can go. I had a picture of some faculty here just to, to highlight in this section that last year we hired in new faculty and new administrative faculty 230 new employees for UNLV. We are clearly out of the recession and we're growing again and finally good to start adding. It's good to start adding again. And we had some retirements and, and variety of other departures. And so at the leadership ranks of the university, we had 12 or 13, if you go back last year or two, folks, new VPs and, and new deans of colleges. And I'll just let this scroll through while you, while you watch this. But what strikes me about the people that are coming in now is the caliber of people in these leadership positions that we're attracting. And the, and the track records they bring with them, the experience and the schools that they're coming from. You can see up there the folks I'm talking about with Diane starting that off uh, now a little over a year ago from University of Central Florida. But we're pulling in people to leadership positions from Clemson, Georgia, uh, University of California, the system office, uh, and the UC Riverside campus, University of Arizona, Virginia Tech, Purdue, Ohio State. I mean, these are good tier one schools, and people are leaving those opportunities to come and be a part of our opportunity. <laughs> we all just saw Carolyn. Did you hear your voiceover? It was pretty cool. We, we'll do, do it again for you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we also, for the first time last year, chose faculty who we thought really captured the top tier spirit. And so this last year, we had three inaugural top-tier award winners. I understand they're here with us today, too, and I just want to point them out quickly. First is Alicia Curlin, the interim director for the Barrick Museum of Art. That's the gym that you saw in many of the pictures. I don't know where Alicia is. She's here somewhere. I can't see. It's too bright. I think next, yeah, Kwan Kim. 
uh, Southwest Gas Professor of Energy and Matter in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Kwon Kim has just also been a, a, just a fabulous professor in engineering, rolling up the accolades. I understand Rama had to get him a second office just for his accolades because <laughs> he's doing so much. <laughs> but, uh, professor Kim's been great. <laughs> And then finally, Jefferson Kinney, of course, associate professor in the Department of Psychology. Congratulations to all three of you and all the faculty that were considered for that. And then, of course, in addition to the five pathway goals for the strategic plan, running through all of them and embedded in all of them are our core values around diversity and inclusion and equity. It's in our DNA. It's who we are. We're proud of it. It makes us stronger. And you could see the activity around those values last year with the opening of the intersection, for example, the Multicultural Advising Services Center, right in prime real estate inside the student union, one-stop shopping for students from underrepresented groups to get help with financial aid or whatever else they need. We ran a very aggressive international search for our next chief diversity officer, another example. And we're, had, we're proud to have our top choice, Dr. Barbie Oaks from Wake Forest, be here now with us. And so much effort ar around our students from underrepresented groups. And I think the thing that makes me most proud is the work that goes on at this university around our most vulnerable students. We have students that when they come in, they're homeless. They're homeless students, and the bed they have in the dorm is the first home they've had for quite some time. So our, our Cohen Scholars Program, Fred, our Hope Scholars Program, all aimed at our most, most vulnerable students, probably the thing that gets me the most and makes me the most proud of what we're doing to live out the values at UNLV. And once again, let's take a quick look at some of the other folks that have been helping out here at UNLV and see what they have to say about our evolution. Here at UNLV, whether it's because of our leadership or because of our proximity to, to business, which is evolving. Things are happening quickly. And I think for, for business people to feel like you can get involved and you can see change happen relatively quickly is really exciting. So I see UNLV as a place that has embraced this city to make it the best place in the world to live. Even after the downturn in a national economy, people are moving here again. This is the place to be. UNLV provides that. Right now in town, we have a new NFL stadium being built. On campus, we have a new Hare Hotel College, for which we're actually ranked the first in the world. My favorite part is the actual UNLV School of Medicine. We have a brand new medical district coming up here in Las Vegas. With it, it's going to bring a new pharmaceutical companies to come here, Amgen, Pharma, Kaiser. Who would not want to spend some time in Las Vegas after doing their research project? And with that, I think it brings a unique growth opportunity to our community and just uh, the level of growth of Las Vegas. That is why I want to stay here and that is why I'm coming to UNLV School of Medicine. I've got to uh, see couples get married. I've been around all our staff and their pregnancies with the babies. I know all the babies. <laughs> so it's like one big family. Yeah. That's great. So we looked at the past. We've kind of surveyed the present at least the last year or so in the, in the performance and, and how we're doing on those pathway goals. And now let's look ahead. It's kind of fun to think where we've come from 60 years ago with those first few buildings in that initial Starbucks and take that 60 years and just flip it all forward 60 years and think about it's hard to even conceive what will be in 60 years. Let's look ahead at some of the things that we've got going on. Of course, we've got a construction image here because this campus is going to grow. It's going to continue growing a lot. We expect not over the 60 years, even just in the next decade, 10 or 15 years, we're likely to be adding an additional two and a half million gross square footage overall in space, and a lot of it aimed at the academic mission here at the university because of the growth in the student body and the accompanying 230 faculty we just hired, we'll be hiring plenty more. 
you'll see uh, big expansions, and broadly speaking, in the academic and teaching side of the house, but also in the research side of the house, you'll see all the engineering building that's coming. We know we need more science and teaching lab space. We know we need more instructional lab space. We know we need upgrades and replacement for fine arts uh, and other areas of the university that are in aging facilities. And so you'll see, number one, I think, thing you'll see is a lot of expansion to the campus footprint. Off campus, but related, uh, this project is now beginning to take shape. I want to thank Chancellor Riley, who's come in now only six weeks in the job, but has played a pivotal leadership role in the negotiations going on around the state and has been a big help to us. Uh, still working on the joint use agreement, hope to have that done soon. That building still is slated to be done in 2020. It means a lot, not just for, of course, the, the Raiders and the NFL, and not only just for the university and what it does for us and for our football program and what that then does for athletics and the doors that it opens for the university in terms of moving on to a Power Five conference at, at some point, but it, it's going to do a lot for this community. That, that facility brings in soccer and so many other kinds of events that don't currently come here because we don't have a facility big enough to house any of them. We're the, this is the entertainment capital of the world and there are events that can't come here because they don't have a venue big enough. You're going to see an expansion to, to student living and student services. Think about where we're at now. I mentioned uh, 4,150 new freshmen, and we like freshmen to live on campus. Right now they can't because we have about 1,800 spots in the dorms, and that's why we're trying to build and acquire apartment complexes around the perimeter of campus to make room for them. But you go out the next 60 years, and I, good golly, I couldn't even predict how big the university would be at that point. But just in the next 10 to 15 years, we expect to go, we think there's demand to go from 30,000 to 40,000 students. And we could quickly find ourselves needing spaces for all the freshmen and maybe sophomores who want to also continue to live on or near campus and needing eight to 9,000 beds just to, just to live on or near campus. We're nowhere near that yet. And that's an expansion that we'll have to see. We continue to work a lot along the Maryland Parkway corridor um, and the Harmon Gateway entrance in particular, where Harmon comes in on Maryland Parkway and then becomes Maud Fraser Way and then kind of cuts into campus there on the east side. Um, a lot of work has gone on there. This is just one of the many ideas from Michael Saltman and his group for what might happen as Harmon comes in from the east and then heads west into campus. Um, this is a rendering of what the Lee Business School's new building that they're envisioning, if that were to be built, that's where it would likely go, kind of right on that new gateway into campus. And then Michael Saltman and his group are helping us think about what those two corners would look like. We own one, he owns the other one. And re-envisioning that as a campus village and a really a new entryway coming into campus. In 60 years, Maryland Parkway will be transformed. I mean, think of Mill Avenue in Tempe, in Tempe as an example. This is another view of what that looked like, kind of as you're flying into the west, looking into campus with that business building on the one side and then other new replacement buildings where, you, where you've got Grant Hall and other things on the right. And it really re-envisions, it's quite exciting to think about what that side of campus will look like. If you're driving north on Maryland Parkway and you hit just before Harmon, you looked over, that's what you would, that'd be the business school. That's what you would see as they've got, uh, uh, they've rendered it with their architect. It's an exciting project just starting to take shape. Our uh, student union is beautiful, but it's packed. We need to double, easily double the size of our student union, and we've begun the planning around doing just that. I think in the next 60 years, you'll not only see a much bigger student union, you'll see probably many of them. Uh, to provide services for all the students and the, and the faculty and staff here on campus. This is an aerial shot looking north on Maryland Parkway. We are in desperate need of a solution on Maryland Parkway, and that's why we've been so supportive of the RTC's efforts at light rail on Maryland Parkway. That would be such a boon for this campus. And think about what they're envisioning. I mean, they're talking about that starting back at the airport, running all the way up Maryland Parkway. I guess I should do this way for you. All the way up through to downtown, hooking around to the medical district, our dental school and medical school in UMC, turning around and then all the way back down past campus and back to the airport. What that would just do for the flow of, of people all around town, what it would do for us 
is that you could have faculty and staff and students on the main campus going back and forth to the medical school or the dental school or any of the other health sciences programs that will eventually be down there. They could make that loop multiple times a day and never have to get into their car. We, at a city that I lived in recently, we did exactly that, a light rail line. This is a picture of it. Almost the exact same loop from the medical school through the campus to the downtown and back again. And it's been very, very successful. We need it here. The 42 acres on Tropicana and Koval, kind of right behind the MGM, between the MGM parking garage and our Thomas and Mac. Now that the, it looks like with almost certainty that the stadium will go over on the Russell Road property, just on the other side of the Mandalay Bay, we've now focused our efforts squarely on the University Village on the 42 acres. And that's good, because we need the space. And what we're envisioning there is that the, keep the undergrads on the main heart of campus primarily, and then graduate and professional education, any kind of clinical activity, anything that's, that's public facing, like our OLLI program with senior citizens, that's ideal for that mixed use university village that we envision on that property on the 42 acres. Probably some housing as well, but it would be more for graduate students or new faculty as they come into campus and they just need somewhere to land for a year or two. But that, that now is where we're squarely focused for that property. And of course, anything we did there, we'd have to work with the city and the county and the airport and the regents for approval before we did anything on that land. But that's now what our planning efforts are all aimed at. And we need that land to do that. Our research park now is up and running, about 122 acres, up off the 215, right near the IKEA. That's the landmark I usually use for people. Better meatballs at the IKEA. But a lot of really good work that goes on at the research park. The Harry Reid Research and Technology Park's got two tenants. We've now engaged with the Gardner Company. That's a, re a real estate developer that specializes in research park. We went out to bid. They won. And they're now working on the first building, the first project. And not in 60 years, in 10 or 15 years, that, that will be built out. The, the half dozen or so buildings will be built. Uh, and that'll be filled with dozens, if not a hundred or more, companies of different sizes, some established companies, a lot of startups, a lot of tech, a lot of biotech, a lot of spin-out activity from the University, Mary and, and Zach, that'll move its way out of discovery on campus and up to the research park and startups and flowing out into the economy. Pretty exciting, Zach led that applause. Thank you. One of the neat things going on around town, you might have noticed that we mentioned the NFL project, is sports. Uh, you know, the new baseball complex being built for the 51s. Hockey teams now built their new complex. Major League Soccer's coming into town. Uh, the NFL's coming into town. We think there's more on the way. Our faculty seizing the opportunity in an interdisciplinary effort from medical school, I think nursing, Physical, uh, physical uh, therapy, athletic training, nutrition, and then uh, community health uh, sciences and some non-health sciences units. I think hospitality and business school were also talking about joining forces with everybody in an effort around sports medicine, right? That's the perfect thing for us to be doing. And faculty are now starting to think about what that would look like, a research institute focused on athletes and not just athletes in professional sports, but the athletes that we have on this strip. These gymnasts, for example, in Cirque du Soleil. This is a, it's just a perfect time for this university to be doing that program. It's really exciting. And then one, finally, one of the, the last big projects. I mentioned the 2,000 acres. In North Las Vegas, there's federal land that's been granted to the university in a collaborative effort participating with the other uh, ENCHI institutions here in the south. If you think of where the VA hospital is on the north side of town, there's a, from the VA hospital in a rectangle north, there's about 2,000 acres that goes right up into the foothills and is beautiful sweeping views of the city. And that's on its way to us uh, for another research park. Incredible opportunities for us there. In the, in the smaller research park over on the 215, we envision a lot of research and development going on inside buildings. On this 2,000 acres, it gives us the ability to do what people talk about as big science, where you need big open, either big buildings or big open spaces to do your work. And, it, and we haven't even begun to think about what we would do there, but just to give you an, something to use to imagine, uh, think about uh, simulating a city, a cityscape, 
where you would, you would design, build, and test autonomous vehicles before you would allow them to leave the property and take the right turn on the expressway and go into town and drive around. Uh, those kinds of big science projects that need to be outdoors and need a lot of space. So we can't wait to get our hands on that land. And then I think this might be the final one. 60 years, I mean, I, I think in 20 years, there'll be a complete build out, 15 years of the academic health sciences, the integrated vision that we've got for it with all of the different areas, the School of Medicine, Dental Medicine, Nursing, Community Health Sciences, Allied Health Sciences, new degrees coming online that we envision in things like pharmacy and occupational therapy, all built out, many of those assets at the Health Sciences campus where the dental school is now, working hand in hand with kind of UMC on one side, Cleveland Clinic over on the other side of the freeway, and all the other partners around the valley. And think about that build out. I mean, you try to imagine 60 years from now what this looks like. In 10, 15, 20 years, the medical school's at full build out with, a, with an economic, not only putting doctors into the community, but with an economic impact of its own of about $3 billion. That's all new. The campus now is a little more than $2 billion a year in economic impact. And that's why we think by the end of the top tier strategic plan, this, this institution's putting five about five to six billion dollars into the economy just, just by ourselves and what we're generating. It's hard to imagine. This university, this is a, I love this picture. It's so vibrant and celebrating the 60th. I think this was because we had free cake at the end of the mall and that's <laughs> what drove all of that traffic. But we are so well positioned. We're already there in many ways. Modern, urban, diverse, responsive, caring, a budding research university, but that's also becoming a school of choice, a, a school that undergrads want to go to and want to study at. We're well positioned. And, and let me just for a moment, I wanna do something just to try. I did this yesterday with our trustees. And then the day before that in an economic development presentation. And I want to try to have you catch a little bit of my enthusiasm for why I'm so excited about this university and where we're going. So let me just set a quick scene for you. This is a, uh, um, this look, looks like those puzzles in grade where those are actually puzzle pieces and you pull them out of a little handle. Um, let me start with this map of the country. First think, just think globally for a second. Remember back in history, the city states where cities like Florence, which was the epicenter for the Renaissance, city-states state, like F Florence were cities that really, they really drove the economy. It was the governing structure. It sort of dictated everything that happened socially. And city-states state, city states ruled everything. And then they all started to join together into empires. The Roman Empire took over. And then those gave way to nations. And then nations then had the rule of law and elections and everything that many of our countries do today. But the city-states really ran the world. People today think that the city-states don't necessarily do, govern things, you know, from, run things from a governance point of view, but that the city-states still run the economy, that they still drive the global economy. And there's, the economists say there's about 300 major cities around the world that that drive the global economy. That kind of doesn't matter on some level what any one global leader says or does. It's really all about the health and vitality of these 300 or so cities. And we're one of them. That's what's interesting. Is we're at about 100 billion GDP annually. We're well within the, the bottom third, but we're within the 300. But what I find the most interesting about it is the velocity with which we are moving up that list. We are back growing as a city like crazy. We're a growing, vibrant, global city driving the global economy. So this is a pretty cool place to live. This is a cool place to be. Okay, second, now to the United States. If you look at the, the population forecasts and the economic forecasts over the next several decades for the United States, think about that map. And you can sum up those forecasts by drawing a line straight through the middle, laterally, through the middle of the United States. Most of the growth, not all, 
but most of the growth over the coming decades is going to occur in the bottom half of the United States. And there are a variety of reasons systemically why that's happening. Part of it is the baby boomers are aging, and so part of the phenomenon is the upper half of the United States is going to retire and move to the bottom half of the United States. <laughs> but it's, it's more than that, because there, there, are, there are systemic economic reasons and business reasons why it's happening. Most of the economists think that the bookends of California and Florida are relatively crowded and expensive and, and not conducive to business growth. And so it's, it's thought to drive a lot of the growth into the interior, but it's going to happen in about a half dozen very unique, uniquely situated places. And I'm going from left to right. We're one of them in southern Nevada. And then in Arizona, it's a corridor, the Sun Corridor. Phoenix and Tucson are growing and connecting. That's another. It skips over to Texas. There are two or three in the state of Texas alone. One of them, uh, just a crazy, uh, unique innovation zone, Houston, just got hit hard from the flooding from Harvey, and that slowed their growth a bit for a while. You skip over probably to Atlanta as the next innovation zone or hyper-intensive growth zone. There are only four or five of them predicted to take, take on most of the growth in the United States in population and in economic growth, and we're one of them. That's, we're in a good place. Again, we're in a good place in the United States. And then it's, a, it's our 60th birthday, and this is a layer cake. One more layer. The final layer is think about the universities. I think I may have said this before in presentations, but think about the universities in the United States right now. If you look in the iPads or any of the federal databases or registries of all colleges and universities, about 4,000 in the United States, including all community colleges and technical and trade schools. And then if you cut that list down to just the doctoral granting research universities, you're down to about 200, really. I mean, that are kind of bona fide doctoral uh, granting research universities. Then if you cut that down to the publics, because that, and that's important, like us, because those are the ones that have an access, access mission. They've got a different mission about what they do to help their communities and to help society. Then you cut that down to the urban. Uh, so the doctoral granting, doctoral research grant, uh, doctoral granting research universities in urban areas uh, that are public. Now you, you cut it down to an even smaller set. And now, cut it down to just the doctoral granting research universities public, urban, in those five, four or five innovation zones. There are only a handful of universities in this country that are uniquely positioned, a finite number of these universities that are in these hyper-intensive growth zones in urban areas, in diverse cities like we're in, that are, I think, uniquely suited to make a difference in this world, in people's lives, and we're one of them. We are different. We're daring. We're very diverse, reflective of our community. We're special. This is a special university, and we have before us a very special opportunity to make a difference. Uh, and that's our responsibility to do so. That's why we're chasing after this top-tier status. Uh, I just I can't believe the opportunity that's before us. And we were blessed with this ranking just two days ago. Unbelievable. Uh, most diverse campus in the country after being ranked second for a few years. And my really fast lawyer subtext on the commercial is tied with two other schools, Rutgers University and Andrews University. <laughs> Rutgers, a large public in, in a lot like us in New Jersey, not in, a, not in an innovation zone. And Andrews University is a small liberal arts college, a few thousand students in, in Michigan. And so I think we're uniquely positioned on that list as well, but we're very proud uh, of, the, of the accolade. One more look at some individuals that have con contributed to our evolution. Let's hear what they have to say. I, I think academically UNLV will stand on its own. In 60 years it'll be one of the top institutions in the country. With the medical school, the dental school, the law school, everything that's happening here, uh, it will offer something for everybody. 
60 years down the line, you know, people on this campus won't even remember uh, exactly what it took to get to top tier. We're just going to take it for granted. We'll be distinguished as an outstanding center for scholarship and research and graduate study nationally and internationally. Uh, I just think we will be bigger and bolder than we are now. Um, I imagine a faculty that has tremendous infrastructure and support uh, to allow them to be outstanding and uh, when we do that that will mean that we will have more graduate students better funded graduate students we will have a larger graduate community on this campus and to me all that translates into the ability to have a greater impact it is exciting that we're putting everything in place so that that becomes possible so it shows me that the future is just limitless I love this final snap. And this takes that original photograph of the first few buildings and morphs it into that last image you saw. I mean, think about the last 60 years. I mean, it's unbelievable for the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Think about how far we've come in the last 60 years. Maude Frazier's vision and her grit uh, got us to where we are today, got, certainly got us the, the journey started. So just imagine what we'll all accomplish together in the next little bit. And then everybody in this community, what they'll accomplish together over the next 60 years for this great university. I hope you feel the excitement that I do. It's a great time to be at UNLV, at this institution, in this place, at this time. It's a great time for UNLV. Let's have one more from Maude. Our dreams are coming true. And from a small beginning, a great campus will develop here. <laughs> thank you Maud Frazier thank all of you for your passion and commitment in building this great university now and into the future thank you and go Rebels <laughs>